and welcome to Rainbow History Class. The, what are we? The queer and trans history you probably don't get in school. I really lost myself there. I was like, we're Rainbow History Class. I don't know how more, much more obvious that can be. It's true. And we're hoping that's the case um, because we're hoping that you have found us and now know who we are. So this is really great. Yeah. My name's Hannah McElhinney. And I'm Rudy Jean Rigg, and I thought that before this I always had something to say, but I, I kind of don't. Okay, this has been the weirdest intro, but it's just the energy that's in the room, and I don't want to be ashamed of it. I've held on unpacking this topic that I'm going to unpack w- with you today because we've sort of done a little bit here and there when we were doing, you know, one-minute episodes on TikTok, but there's a whole lot to unpack here, and it's such a spicy topic that really just divides everyone, gets everyone riled up. So I'm like, I cannot enter the conversation in one minute. But now we have more than one minute on this podcast. I am going to, for the first time, speak about something that I have a lot of feelings about, but we have proper time to unpack them all. And that is the lesbian master doc. Oh my God. I thought you were going to say, is the gay earring in the left or the right ear? That I know about. Okay. So we're talking about the lesbian master doc and I felt, I can see your eyes being like, I've never read this. What? So the Lesbian Master Doc is something that is perennially relevant. It's always being, you know, quoted and it kind of comes up as part of a retrospective on different kind of sapphic internet patches um, according to like queer media and things like that. Like it's often resurfaced. But it's called the Am I a Lesbian? Question mark. Master Doc. I remember the only time I have seen this is it was going around on Tumblr back in the day. I'd say like maybe 2009, 2010. Much later. 2018 was when it first reared its head. Really? Yeah. Now, something something else back because I remember it, people were arguing with something. Now, maybe it was a list. Maybe it wasn't a document. Maybe it was just a bulleted list. It pulls from a lot of first person accounts yes from people from tumblr and it has a list of credits at the end which are other tumblr okay so it was being kind of molded it's just that this particular user um who goes by the name cyber lesbian compiled that in 2018 into the lesbian master doc and then put that on tumblr okay because what i'm remembering is a maybe a portion of what ended up in this list and people were arguing about whether it should be used as a criteria as to whether you were lesbian or whether you were trans. And I just remember being like, what the fuck? And just scrolling by. Well, it sounds, yeah, similar thing, um, different. This doesn't have really much to do with gender. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is part of its shortcomings. Uh, And I want to say that, like, the approach for this episode is I want to tell you what it is. I want to critique it and then I do want to defend it as well. Interesting. Okay. okay. And that's separate to my personal views on whether or not I find it relevant, useful, or plain ridiculous. And are you going to tell us your personal views today? I think so. Keep okay. it juicy. I mean, it's not that I have personal views either way, but it's whether or not this is a helpful document or would have been a helpful document to me. Who knows? Sure. But it's 30 pages long. Now, it was originally a Google Doc. And it's now been saved as a PDF because the link's broken. (laughs) I can't believe someone's like, here's my personal Gmail um, and you can access my Google Drive. I think it's great. I mean, I think Google as an open source-ish, you know, Google Docs as a sort of accessible hub for information. I'm really interested in how it's being used by queer communities Mm. or other marginalized communities. but. In this particular sense, it's 30 pages long and it's essentially, it sees itself as a bit of a guide um, for people questioning their sexuality, women questioning their sexuality. So like I said, I want to criticize a bit of it. I then want to defend it by looking at it as part of, you know, a canon of uh, queer self-publishing. It's like, um, you know, BuzzFeed used to do all those quizzes. Right. It's like um, the BuzzFeed quiz canon. but. It- it kind of is. It kind of is, and that's how it reads. Um, but since 2018, so it started on uh, Tumblr, but it was really on TikTok in 2020 where <laughs> so many people had queer awakenings. <laughs> yeah. In 2020, I think all these the, that For You page algorithm just turned a lot of people gay. 
mm. uh, which I'm sure that was its intent. Do you like houseplants? You're gay. Essentially, yes. And then the next video is the same. Yeah. I think that's where it started to, you know, go cross platform from Tumblr into TikTok and it was shared um, around there. And it was also kind of people were reporting on it or like finding different things in it. And so basically it really got blown up and kind of the meanings of everything I think were probably taken a little out of context and the doc itself is taken out of context. So there's a lot of hearsay, a lot of layers of kind of um, interpretation happening. Yeah. But I want to go through of it, uh, go through a bit of it with you. I have it here and I thought it would be fun to see if you're a lesbian. Yes, let's play this game. So... Um, <laughs> are you going to mark my responses so we can actually decide? I wish that there was like a scorecard at the end. There's not. The UX um, is so bad. I am. <laughs> the grammar is so bad. Oh. I mean, the font is big and it's double spaced, but I'm going to scroll down to page 24. Okay. You might be a lesbian if TLDR. Okay, great. You need the TLDR here. Okay, so I'm going to answer these questions. Okay, do you wish you were a lesbian so you could escape the discomfort of dating men? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I'm gonna try and get in the mind. No. Okay. Do you think men are okay in theory, but terrible in practice? What kind of question is that? <laughs> Do you think men are okay in theory, but terrible in practice? Yeah. No. Okay. Um, do you feel like you could live with a woman in a romantic way, even if you can't imagine doing anything sexual with a woman? Yes. Do you feel like you could enjoy sexual interaction with a woman, even if you can't imagine having romantic feelings for a woman? That just I'm a, makes no sense. I'm asexual, so that's not really very <laughs> inclusive. Well, I think what's actually interesting that you say is that there is kind of um, a bit of a asexual version of oh. this that has spawned, but we'll get to that. Okay. It was my favorite bit. You might be a lesbian if, TLDR, you lose interest in a man as soon as they seem interested in you, hyphen, bold, very common. <laughs> Hang on, that's more indicative of ADHD than it is about lesbianism. Do you expect relationships with men to be unfulfilling by default? Uh, no, because I'm a glass half full kind of person. <laughs> Do you dislike being attracted to men in general? No, actually, I love men, regrettably. Are you only attracted to fictional men, celebrities, or men that are completely unattainable, i.e. your teacher, gay men, or men in established relationships? Basically, you only like men if it's impossible for them to like you back. Whoa. Very common. I think this is saying a lot about internalized misogyny. Really? Well, yeah, because it's speaking more about how women view themselves through the lens of a man rather than what women want. Do you think all straight women feel attraction to women at to at least some extent. Yeah, maybe. I'm not a woman. How would I know this? <laughs> Do you dread the idea of a future with a man? No. Do you think men attracted women over-exaggerate their attraction to men and you can't comprehend finding a man as attractive as they do? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can you say that again but slower? Do you think men attracted women over-exaggerate their attraction to men and you can't comprehend finding a man as attractive as they do? So, so women who like men over exaggerate how much they like men and you can't understand finding a man as attractive as they seem to find men that sounds like a social cue issue to me <laughs> okay so are you a lesbian or autistic yeah basically <laughs> so the tldr is actually quite long uh, and there's a lot of different things in here. For example, like you don't like kissing, touching, having sex with your husband or boyfriend, or you're not attracted to your husband or boyfriend, but it must be because he's not the one for you or another excuse. There are a whole lot of symptoms in here that Whoa. might mean that you could be lesbian. Hang on. And so it's not very intersectional. That's what I'm getting. Well, no. And also kind of, you could just be. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Or, or pansexual or just not into your particular boyfriend or haven't found love with anyone or you might be asexual or it could be really anything. I mean, none of these symptoms in themselves are like particularly 
uh, telling. I'm sorry, this is like a WebMD article telling me I'm dying in five seconds because I got a cold sore or something. It is. It's very much a WebMD article for dying, diagnosing you as a lesbian. Oh, I'm sorry. I know this has probably helped a lot of people, but this to me, it's got more red flags than a red flag section in a craft store if that ever existed. <laughs> <laughs> it's I think there's so many things in here that are really not necessarily things that point to you being a lesbian. No. However, like I guess if I when I look at this, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Like it's a joke that I turned it into a quiz and gave it to you, mm. a uh non-binary tr- trans mask queer person in a relationship with a man. Yeah. <laughs> um but if I look at a lot of them you know, I do want to say, like, do feel um, true well, to me. Like some of them to me, I'm like, okay, this is good grounds for conversation. But other ones where it's like, it just, it's really, these questions are just, then I don't know, they're more about like upholding certain gender roles or like, I don't know. It just, it kind of, it, it kind of, there is a sit look, right with me. There is a bit um, of that, you know, like I think some of it does ring true. So the idea of like not being sure whether or not you are attracted to a man or you just want them to be attracted to you. Yeah. That's one of them. Um, you think that your relationships with men don't work out because you're bad at relationships in general or only being attracted to really f- um, feminine men. Mm. Uh, all of those things have felt true for me at some point. The idea of, you know, you don't want to date men, but you feel like you have to, you yeah. know, as a teenager, that made sense. The idea of men are okay in theory, but terrible in practice. <laughs> that resonated to me. Because- I'm sorry. I thought you just said meta arcane theory. Oh my God. Like- and then you got excited. And then I was like, hang on, we're talking about magic in the metaphysical realm. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. Some of them is like, you know, you find yourself trying to be romantically or sexually appealing to men, even if you're not interested in them. I mean, I think that's a very socialized behavior, but absolutely I, you know, have resonated with a lot of these things Mm. at some point. I think what it is dangerous is it is suggesting that you're a lesbian or you're straight versus you know, you could be anything and there's almost no intersection of gender in this document yeah. um, and how, you know, your experiences of being, you know, a woman can be affected by yeah. who you're attracted to or, you know, there's so much that it doesn't contain. But it's quite sweet as well. I think there's like a niceness to it where okay. this is the type of document that if I had had access to it when I was, say, you know, 14 or 15. Like it's quite positive towards being a lesbian. Uh, It probably would have resonated back then. It's written in quite a sweet sort of tween uh, manner and I think it may have been helpful and it has helped so many people come out. Like Kalani cites it as (laughs) as the root awakening of her sapphic sexuality. Obviously I want to caveat you know, the, the problems with it is that I do think that it can be quite erasing of the bi experience yeah. because it's it, it's a lot of it is essentially saying, you know, um, are you only attracted to men because of this reason um, rather than saying, yeah, okay, you can be attracted to men because you're attracted to yeah. them reason as well as yeah. whoever else you might be attracted to. Yeah. And like you pulling out that that section and do and running it against me like a BuzzFeed quiz is a really great example of how it's lost nuance or how quickly it loses nuance and understanding when you do pull it out of its context. Like, and you know, could you imagine someone going, put a finger down and doing that on TikTok? Put a finger down if, if you've ever only been attracted to a male celebrity because yeah. you think he's unattainable. Yeah. And I think that again. It's hard because I guess maybe this thing's brilliant and I am a lesbian, but I think I grew up thinking that Leonardo DiCaprio was very attractive. Now, one, he's an effeminate looking person. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Two, but... fairly unattainable. Uh, and three, I really wouldn't want to date him in practice. I'm certainly like three times too old yeah. to date him in practice now. And so according to that, I guess maybe I would glean that I was a lesbian. What it doesn't take into account is there's another – big reason that I'm a lesbian and that's because I really like girls yeah (laughs) like there's no nothing in this list well that's the thing do you think women are hot and want to date and kiss them and marry them it's like um they're using like a process of elimination it is but it's like that's that's um 
inductive reasoning, which in if you're a philosophy nerd, you'll know that there's inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning and both of them have pros and cons. But in this sense, like inductive reasoning is saying, have you only ever seen a white swan? Would you assume that any other color of swan exists if you've only ever seen a white swan? And kind of using that sort of um, basis and then using that to surmount that no black swans don't exist because of like exactly what I just went through, which is is kind of harmful in, in a lot of ways and has to be used in a particular fashion to be yeah, like it might successful. Work when we're talking about swans, but when we're talking about people, I think what's interesting is that, yes, individually all of these things could mean that you're a lesbian. However, one of them, you know, you think you have to learn how to love men. It's like, okay, but there's a lot of reasons that you might find yourself in that situation. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have had poor experiences with men in your life, definitely that would contribute to that type of feeling. There are a lot of reasons why you might not fall into the arms of a man immediately uh, and not all of them will be because you are a lesbian. Yeah. However, uh, I think that was the thing. If there was a line in here that was like, are you obsessed with women and think they're amazing, that would be probably more compelling to me mm. than any of these mm. other ones. Did you want to kiss Kira Knightley and bend it like Beckham? Yes or no? It's easy. There are easy, <laughs> there are easy ways. So these are kind of like the basically the lesbian master doc is really just like a catch-all to ensure you're not missing anything. Right. So assuming that the what the the People that know they're a lesbian instantly because, you know, they watch Bend It Like Beckham and they, they're in from that. There are the Tegan and Sarah fans. Cool. They're over the the bridge. There are, you know, people that grew up on the L word. Cool. They know. Now, this is just the stragglers. Mm. Um, the people that would never think that they were a lesbian, uh, but that's because they haven't considered all of these points. Okay. Now, the reasoning for this document and why these things are very kind of subtle and vague and laid out in a certain way is that they're basically building a case against something called compulsory heterosexuality. Right, yes. And that is really what the main theme of this lesbian master doc is, mm. is this idea of compulsory heterosexuality. And in the context of this document, it's the suggestion that women have been socialized to be attracted to men and therefore we might not know that we're actually attracted to women or we might feel attraction towards women and convince ourselves um uh, Otherwise, mm. it's just because of this or it's just I just need to do a bit more of this. So this is why they're talking about compulsory heterosexuality. And while it is true that when you're dating people and you're a teenager, you know, I remember having like a boyfriend or feeling a pressure to have a boyfriend or thinking, oh, that guy seems to like me, so he'll do. I think, yes, the idea of compulsory heterosexuality is certainly something that does affect us when we're very young. But it's not a term that was invented by the Am I a Lesbian Master Doc. It was a term invented in the 80s mm. uh, and it its meaning has been distorted. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to take you back uh, take to you the back original. To three <laughs> times, hot nights, everything's going to be all right in the 80s. Oh, with that term you used, I don't remember it. I'm letting it play out. <laughs> okay. Are you going to join me? No, 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 no. I was just going to see how we could like taper out. But I'm going to come in back. We're talking about compulsory heterosexuality. And if you were to type that into your social media hashtags, compet is how it's frequently known and it's almost always trending in the in queer social media circles. I can't believe you just sorry. I can't believe you just let me do that. You're in control of the edit, Rudy Jean Rig. I just <laughs> wanted to hear you sing. So in 1980, the term compulsory heterosexuality came from a, a paper, an essay, by a, a radical lesbian feminist by the name of Adrian Rich. In 1980, she wrote this paper. It was called Compulsory Heterosexuality and the Lesbian Experience. Now, it's very, like, dense and academic, and it came out of second wave 
radical lesbian feminism. So obviously we had feminism, um, but then radical lesbian feminism was a response to lesbians being left out of the women's rights movement and mainstream feminism. Okay. So part of it's awesome. That's where you get like the lavender menace and people kind of being really radical in their response to, I guess, mainstream feminism, which really privileged straight white women and still kind of does. Um, but it's a bit kind of more complex than woohoo. So yeah, uh, compulsory heterosexuality was the idea that we are born into a patriarchal society and that then dictates that all of our attraction as women should be towards men. And it is pervasive through all areas of life and, yeah, that's what we're living under. So it's patriarchal and we're under compulsory heterosexuality. Now, what Adrienne Rich wanted was for women to opt out of the patriarchy altogether. So to, the only way to escape compulsory heterosexuality was to remove yourself from that entire construct. Optionally. Yeah, you have you had to opt out. Yes. Otherwise, you've got all these sleepers under the spell of compulsory heterosexuality. Oh, so it was like um awakening. Yeah, it was it was consciousness raising. We're awakening. We're saying, "Oh, this is the matrix that we're living in. We need to opt out." Now, she also used the term lesbian existence as opposed to lesbianism. So, okay. Lesbianism was seen as like a medical term or something that described only your attraction towards women, whereas lesbian existence Adrian Rich believed encompassed, you know, the whole of lesbian histories and culture and, you know, so much more than just something as silly. <laughs> she didn't say silly, silly or flippant as girls liking girls. So what you need to know about that is it all sounds really kind of good, mm. I guess, from my perspective. Cool, let's dismantle the patriarchy. Let's opt out of the whole thing. Uh, let's not just reduce lesbians to their desire and attraction and instead, you know, include all of our history and culture. Yes, check, check. Um, but it was connected to lesbian separatism. So this basically means that in order to avoid compulsory heterosexuality, lesbians needed to separate themselves from the world pretty much from the culture, from society entirely. And engaging with the patriarchy or benefiting it from it in any way was uh, betraying radical lesbian feminism, betraying, um, you know, the lesbian separatist movement uh, and was kind of taking a step back for feminism. Okay. So something that came out of this was, and I want to, you know, in one sense, it's like, hell yeah, absolutely. Like, let me go live in a lesbian coven over there and not deal with, you know, cis men. Yeah. Because they're causing all sorts of trouble yeah. constantly. Oh, those it's in the news. Troublemakers. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Like we're in an epidemic of gender-based violence and yeah. it's, you know, the, the perpetrators are cis men. And um, so I kind of get it. But that meant that if anybody did have an attraction to, to men or engage with men, then they were kind of ostracized from the movement. So it was very anti-bisexuality. Mm. So bisexuals were betraying, um, you know, the cause. It was very bioessentialist. Yeah. So the idea that women, by way of being socialized as a woman upon birth, uh, were kind of, I guess, victims of compulsory heterosexuality unless they awakened themselves and, you know, left it. Uh, and it really spawned the political lesbian. So political lesbians, it was a really big thing kind of in the 80s where women who might be attracted to men, be otherwise straight in terms of their attraction, would get in a relationship with another woman um, for political reasons. Okay. So the word lesbian in 1980 wasn't really about who you like to sleep with. It was about, um, it was a political identity, yeah. what you stand for and how you were going to kind of opt out of compulsory heterosexuality. Now, it's super binary. Um, yeah, that's what I'm getting. Yeah, a lot of the um, feminists at this time also thought that trans masculine people um, were kind of, betraying the cause much like bisexual people um though they were much more open to 
I guess, trans masculine people than they were to trans feminine people. Yeah. Um, and again, that really comes down to this idea of like an experience of womanhood being like cemented to the sex you're assigned at birth. Adrian Rich. Now, she is or was, um, she, uh, she died, but Adrian, yes, yeah, sorry. sorry. I was trying to think of how do I, I'm like, I don't want to say she passed away because it's not like I she knew went her gently personally. went into the night. Yeah, she, she, um, <clears throat> so she died. So Adrian Rich, she was n- definitely not the most, the most vocal turf, but. Okay. Her so poli- you, you would say she was a turf. I would say she was a turf. Yeah. I would say like when I think one thing, and I don't want to criticize how the word turf is being used, but I think the word turf is being used by and, you know, in relation to people that are overtly transphobic for whatever reason. Mm. Um, whereas Adrian Rich, I would call her a turf, um, but like within a time period that was very cemented into her, like a specific version of mm. feminism, I'd say like most people that are being called TERFs at the moment are not feminist in any way, shape or form. And I'm not yeah. really sure if Adrian Rich was. Um, I do know that perhaps like she, her work was really seminal, especially to kind of the politics of people like Leslie Feinberg. Yeah. So I think it's possible that Adrian's views might have changed over time, but I do want to call out that she was um, very – an active part of uh, a book called The Transsexual Empire. And in this book, uh, she describes trans women as men who have given up the supposed ultimate possession of manhood in a patriarchal society by self-castration. What the fuck? I know, I know. So that is like a quote attributed to her. So I think it's fair to say that Adrian Rich is a turf. Um, yeah. And I think as well... Something that really irks me about this type of thinking, because it's still prevalent, you know, Mm. like I feel like there are so many people that hold these views still, um, is that this idea that TERFs say that any kind of gender-affirming interventions, um, you know, surgeries or HRT, medicines, don't make you a woman because a woman is more than biology. That's what the TERFs are saying. You can't go do this and all of a sudden you're a woman. Hang on a minute. Right. Yet that's what trans people and their allies are saying too. Like you can be a woman regardless of the body that you are born in. And also any medical intervention that you may or may not want to partake in. Yeah, like I think in a weird sense the TERF rhetoric has kind of come full circle and they don't know what they think anymore because on one hand, you know, you're either a woman because of your biological makeup and body parts, um, in which case that's one way of doing it. But then on the other hand, oh, hang on, you can't just have surgeries to become a woman because it's so much being a woman is so much more than your biological. Yeah. Makeup. So it's, it doesn't make sense to me. It's 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 I don't know what would please a turf. Really, I can't think of anything. No, because I feel like it's it's they they're the kind of people that have an excuse for any logical argument, and they will just yeah, what dickheads. Honestly, <laughs> yeah, that's all I have is what dickheads. So I guess like you know, and I, I'm really like. I, I never want to like pour petrol on like a, a TikTok fire, but when we talk about compulsory heterosexuality, we are using a framework and an um, I guess a concept, an academic concept that is inherently uh, a raising of bi experiences, pan experiences. It is a raising of kind of a spectrum of gender identities as well uh, and it's super super binary and bio essentialist so I do think that when I see it like written up in the uh, lesbian master doc I'm a bit like um I don't think that they they've nailed yeah the point however um I think at the end of the day maybe you know obviously concepts change and maybe what they're referring to as compet is probably more just heteronormativity. Well, yeah, probably because that's the thing. It's like, like who, like, and this is less of a critique, like a personal critique on the person that put this together, but like it is more of that like you always, I mean, when it comes to quote-unquote primary sources, it's like pr- people 
often will go, oh, it's primary source, like we can trust it. It's like, whoa, 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 hang on. The primary source has a even more primary source. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like you got to consider that too and like how old were they? What are their politics? How did they grow up? What do they believe in? Like, do you know what I mean? Like it's it's much more than that because it's like everything you that makes up you – Everything that makes you up as a person contributes to everything that you do, and this is no exception. So it would be interesting to kind of uncover that, but obviously we're not going to go there that much today. No, and I I think that was the thing. I think when we look at – I do think uh, the concept of um, being sapphic or a lesbian in the TikTok era has changed a little bit. You know, I think I'm seeing so much more conversation around, um, you know, you can be a lesbian or identify as a lesbian and maybe date men or, you know, you, you know, support for non-binary lesbians and all of those types of conversations that are always happening on the internet. I will note that the doc does specify that if you are a lesbian and then date a man, you can't be a lesbian anymore. Oh, you got to revoke your car. You got to, you got to send it back. Yeah. Damn. So, <laughs> damn, yeah, you've got to take, you've got to get yeah, that like nautical star tattoo removed and you've got to yeah. hand your carabiners off at the local bouldering gym. <laughs> yeah. But I think, yeah, so I definitely want to critique this document, one, for saying that I think that it's probably not that helpful. What's more helpful is am I a lesbian? Do you feel like one? <laughs> is that something that you're interested in? Yeah. Is have a look. There's heaps of other things. Yeah. I think it's probably good to sort of be aware as something to be aware of like, oh, okay, you know, am I making assumptions or do I feel yucky about these things that are, you know, I feel like I'm supposed to pursue. It's good to self-reflect and maybe this document helps you do that. Um, But certainly speaking, I think that it's a bit, I don't know, it's probably not great. I feel like. <laughs> for, pe- for people, especially if because there's so many other things you can be. Yeah. I feel like as, you know, I, present day me isn't really, can't really come at this as from the perspective of a lesbian, but I definitely know before I like knew I was trans and I was like trying to figure out my sexuality, like as someone who did identify as like a woman or like a girl or whatever. This to me is a little bit like, I wouldn't say insulting is not the right word. But, like, it does kind of give me the vibe of, like, overcomplicating what could be, like, a a different conversation. I I, I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. It is really, really reductive. And I think maybe it is helpful because I do have to say I did do a lot of quizzes when I was discovering myself. At one point I, like, got a bunch of Abercrombie and Fitch ads with models with these men with their shirts off and then a bunch of, like, chicks, pictures of chicks, like, models or actresses or whatever and I go one for one and just see which one I found I thought was more attractive to try and glean some meaning from that yeah. so if I'd found this I would have absolutely gone through it and been like oh I'm a lesbian at the end but I also just think the best way of finding out if you're a lesbian is being open-minded meeting different people, trying different things out, talking to different people, seeing what fits, you know, and yeah. going from there rather than this kind of checkbox quiz type thing. Yeah, like there's no hard and fast way to be anything, you know, like we have stereotypes but I, I in general would not suggest leaning against them um, in terms of like uh, if I don't have a bouldering subscription, I can't be a lesbian, or like, you know, if I don't have a cavoodle name, Sandrine, I can't be a lesbian. It's a very rigid stereotype. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, that's not anyone I know. What are you talking about? (laughs) Um, uh, But, you know, that's the thing. It's like um, it's great to be able to like use this as sort of like an eye-opener, but at the end of the day you kind of do need to sort of like just – I feel like this document really wants you to, I don't know, look outward in in a weird way. I feel like we should be looking inward. I think so. And uh, one thing I do feel for a lot of young people, probably it's shutting a lot of doors, you know, like you can be straight. You can be pansexual. You can, you know, I, I would hate for someone to read this, have a crush on a dude in their class mm-hmm. and then be like, oh, you're really nice and I think I really like you, but that's compulsory heterosexuality so I'm going to cut that off yeah or like you know someone exploring bisexuality and then just thinking oh you know what actually this is compulsory heterosexuality I'm a lesbian because the thing is is like 
you can be a lesbian, but you can be straight, you can be bi, you can be anything. Um, it's like that Mika song. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sing it. You can be. It just keeps going. There now. we go. Yeah. Um, so now I've kind of been critical on of it. I want to now defend it. Okay. Because I think that it's not very relevant or useful to me from my perspective right now, but I'm also not going to like invalidate anyone that has found that really useful. Oh, yeah. But I do, the way that I do want to celebrate it is because I think it's just the the latest or a really recent example of queer community publishing and there's such a long history of that. So there's things like zines and manifestos. I think last week on the episode you were speaking about, um, you know, a pamphlet that was kind of educating people on how to express themselves more mas- in a more masculine fashion, um, you know, for, for trans men. So I think these things are everywhere. We've had zines, manifestos, kind of like Adrian Rich's, I guess. Um, but I want to specifically look at less conceptual ideas ones and more uh, the ones that exist to educate and help um, the community by making gatekept information more accessible to the masses Mm -hmm. because essentially, obviously, queer people have been marginalised so we can't always look to the traditional education institutions um, to get our knowledge. We're either not represented or we're represented incorrectly. So we've had to sort of do it for ourselves. Um, so I want to c- give you a couple of examples. Uh, so 1825. Whoa. Yeah, I told you we had a long history. Uh, <laughs> okay. A German man named Karl Heinrich Ulrichs was born in 1825. Oh, yeah. And so he was somebody that he always, always felt different from other people. He felt like he had this innate feminine streak Mm -hmm. um and then he grew up to become this writer journalist and a lawyer or like a jurist which is uh like a scholar of the law okay uh and he was spent a lot of this time like really preoccupied with his attraction to men so in 1862 he came out so he was the first person in western history to come out okay uh as or as gay but he came out as he used the word earning Yes. Right. So that was his word um, to describe an innate attraction to men that some men are born with. Yes. And this was the first time that homosexuality was seen as an identity versus like an act. Yes. Because he was theorizing that, okay, if it's innate, then it should not be criminalized. It's something that within us so you can be earning Mm. versus – do sodomy which was kind of how it was thought of in the years leading up to it um and because sodomy was a crime the whole point of him educating people about this through these pamphlets was um that he wanted to decriminalize it because he saw sodomy as a symptom of an innate identity and if something's innate and you can't help it then it should not be criminalized so while he was doing this uh he started publishing these educational pamphlets under the name numa numantius i assume it's latin (laughs) what does that mean um no i don't know um but this explained his understanding of sexuality and it helped others find themselves including other kind of pioneers like there was another carl um Carl Marie Kurt Benny, who was Hungarian, he came up with the word homosexual. Oh, yeah. Um, He was inspired by this Carl. So, again, when we look at these pamphlets uh, that have been used throughout history to educate the community when the outside institutions would be pathologizing us, um, they're really kind of groundbreaking and helpful uh, and validating. They're So, so good. This was really about like cultural and societal ideas. Um, And in the 50s and 60s, these kinds of things proliferated. Um, They were very educational in terms of things like safe places to go, um, where the beats were, and even kind of a hanky code decoder was a popular pamphlet (laughs) that, uh, that was around in the 60s. But queer publishing in an educational sense also created access to medical information. Yeah. So. That's super important. 
Totally. So if we look at the 1980s, we are in the AIDS crisis, so 80s and 90s. And so, again, this was an example where we had a very kind of, you know, inept, not that you could be ept dealing with such a new illness, but mm. it was a very stigmatized illness and there was the government in the US when was not particularly motivated um, with things like harm reduction and community care. It was very much like find a cure and as soon as... Um, they found something, you know, it was kind of hard to access and n- they weren't really testing the efficacy of the drug once they'd found something they thought kind of worked. And so really it was up to the community to actually care for each other and look after each other and, and share health information. So they did that through a lot of these kind of pamphlets or mm. I guess zines, publications, community publications. There was one called DPN, which is the Diseased Pariah News. Oh, great. Yeah, it was like very, very black black humour. It existed. Um, according to it, DPN is a patently offensive publication of, by, and for people with HIV disease and their friends and loved ones. The purpose of this publication was to be a forum for infected people to share their thoughts feelings, art, writing, and brownie recipes mm-hmm. in an atmosphere free of teddy bears, magic rocks, and seronegative guilt. Whoa, hang on. You lost me after the teddy bears. Magic rocks and seronegative guilt? Is- so teddy bears, magic rocks. So teddy bears, I believe, might have referred to the infantilization of um, patients in a hospital yes. setting, trying to cheer them up with things like teddy bears, magic rocks. Um, is kind of all of the snake oil or even government promised cures. A lot yeah. of these drugs um, were like magic rocks. They just sort of they didn't work or they caused a lot of harm. And then, of course, Sarah negative guilt is, um, you know, being made to feel guilty from uh, by people that aren't HIV positive. Oh, uh, yeah. So I think what was really good about um, that one is – it had so much education for a community that was really marginalised and um, unable to access it. So about things like drugs and things. But there's one I'm reading. A, I'm reading this to you, but it, it's a section called "Get Fat, Don't Die," and it's high calorie cooking with Biffy May. Okay. And what it is is it's essentially nutrition advice on how to keep your body weight up as um, best as possible because that was the most important thing if you were diagnosed with HIV. Yeah. You needed to um, put on as much weight as you could. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, definitely. a side, And also you would lose weight because of the disease but also the side effects of a lot of the medication. Uh, yeah. um, so it was telling you to do things like, you know, drizzle liberal amounts of sauce or gravy over your food, use honey on your toast and cereal in coffee and tea, um, add dry milk to foods to boost calories, you know, things like add lots of butter, margarine, cream cheese, sour cream, cheese, mayonnaise to your vegetables and starchy foods. So it was telling you to do these things. And then there was a bunch of uh, recipes in here. So Biffy May's gingerbread pudding, Jeffrey May's Thai chicken curry, or Austin May's vanilla poached pears. And they're super high calorie recipes that people could cook. And then underneath it is an image of a naked man on a platter. Whoa. Which I will show you, but we can't show people because it's very rude. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah, so it was kind of fun. They're in, like, it's in the right kind of way of speaking to the community and it is really helpful because the only way you'd get this information is, one, if you were able to access or had insurance and you were able to access somebody that could help you with your diet and nutrition, so medical system that cared and then had the money to access that and then were able to buy certain foods. And this, it was really accessible because it's just like add whatever fat you can find and sugar you can find onto your whatever it is you're eating. Yeah. So, again, I think that's another example of, like, community publishing by and for using lived experience experience as opposed to institutional science. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I have one more example for you that I want to add, and it is kind of this one is also famous because it is uh, very useful, uh, and it is by a trans woman called Mira Bellwether, and it was published in 2010, and it's called Fucking Trans Women. Why do I know? I mean, it's a a classic. It's a classic. Yeah, why do you know this? I mean, basically it is about 50 pages 
Mira illustrated it all herself and she wrote it all and it is so detailed about um, the anatomy of trans women and how to, I guess, pleasure themselves or find pleasure in a trans woman's body. Yeah. And it goes so detailed. Like it's got diagrams of like nerve networks. Really? um, And it basically taught like a generation of trans women about muffing um, or different ways to kind of, yeah, I guess use their bodies um, during sex that we're definitely not taught Mm -hmm. in sex ed, not that we're taught anything in sex ed in school, but there is no way that you would be able to access some of this information. There's even a bit that says here, branches of the genitofemoral nerve. Yeah, I'm looking at some photos. Google is trying its best to blur things out, but I'm telling you. Yeah, some thoughts on making the most of your P, I, G, and plexus nerves. So this is, again, a document that was circulated, you know, on Tumblr, That's so um, cool. in underground means that basically gave a crash course based on lived experience, so the experience of trans women um, who have like spoken about how they have sex, and it's been mm. compiled, added with a bit of science, and here we have um, something that really was so useful and changed um, the lives of so many trans women. That's really cool. So. I want to round back to the lesbian master doc and say this. When I first read it, I thought, good God, no. <laughs> like me an hour ago. Yeah. I I went through it and I was like, this is so kind of reductive. But then I stopped because I went back and I looked at different ways that our community has tried to share information based on our lived experiences where there hasn't been information or a guide available. Mm. And I I started to think a bit differently about the lesbian master doc because if you were to Google am I a lesbian and went onto some government website, they absolutely would not be talking about things like compulsory heterosexuality or they might not be talking about, you know, the experience of having a crush on a male celebrity but not being able to find someone that you like in real life. Yeah. So in that sense, they are lived experiences that are useful. And when put in the canon of queer publishing, I think that's a more interesting way of looking at it and seeing the role of it and its role helping people, Mm. even if the ideas within it come from kind of maybe questionable places um, and there's like seven pages of you might be a lesbian if TLDR. I mean, <laughs> listen, so, girls got some things to do. We can't be sitting around all day. It's true. It's true. <laughs> you think attraction is just not being disgusted by a man. Well, you could literally just like superimpose being autistic, being neurodivergent, being asexual, being literally anything other than lesbian onto this. And it could be – anyway, I don't want to actually – You actually – no, you actually could. And, you know, the ace community, they have since spoken about compulsory sexuality, which is kind of – Yeah. The, um, any kind of warm or pleasant positive feelings towards somebody being um, – you know, perceived by society as sexual attraction instead of, you know, all of the other ways you can feel towards someone. Yeah, literally. I mean, that's a whole other episode. That's a whole other episode. (laughs) And again, you can see these things, you know, you might be trans if. Unfortunately, these things, they're super complex and, and tailored, but I do think that there are people trying to make sense of it. And while what was in Carl Heinrich Ulrich's pamphlet in, you know, um, the late 1800s, if you read that now, you're like, no, that's a bit reductive. Yeah, of course. He did think that gay men had a feminine, had a woman's spirit inside of them. Um, <laughs> and that's not how we see things now. So oh, I guess, yeah. you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and the Am I a Lesbian Master Doc is just 2018's addition into the self-publishing canon of hey, queer communities. Someone got had to do it. I mean, I mean, look, that would have been a hard job trying to collate all that information and like dis- like distill it into what it, it became. So thank so, you, Cyber Lesbian on Tumblr. Yeah. But she, that is, that's all I've got for you. Thank you. I mean, I, yeah, I was very much just like, what, the f- what is this? 
this is so silly. Like, I can't believe people took this seriously. I feel like, you know, at the beginning before I knew, you know, a lot about it and before you sort of drew us into like the space of like, uh, you know, community publications and, and, and things like that, I definitely was like more like, mm, like this is like, really mm. so but now I have a lot more empathy of it and I can completely understand how obviously like it's helped people um and and how much can I speak because I'm not a lesbian I'm not a woman and I haven't even dated that many women in my life so <laughs> I don't have much lived or conceptual experience um so I'm willing to uh, sit back and you know and listen and learn I will not be making a do- master doc for <laughs> my experience because I don't think I could fit that in a master doc. Uh, thank you for sticking with us. Please check us out on socials at Rainbow History Class and um, have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to promote the Discord, but yeah, I was. Nice no, I do. I want to promote the Discord, but I want everyone to have a nice day first and foremost. We have a Discord. If you didn't listen to the episode last week, you would have missed this little public service announcement. But we do, in fact, have a Discord, and the link to it is in our episode notes. Please go over there and check it out. Um, even if you don't normally use Discord, I feel like Discord is a great platform to get into. It's a little bit of a foreign, foreign thing, even for me. Um, but we have a great community growing on there and I highly encourage you checking it out if you have been looking for a great inclusive community space online. We have a Patreon as well if you have some extra change rattling around in your pockets so we know not uh, a lot of people do at the moment, which is totally fine. Um, our Patreon has a free member level, so you do not need to contribute financially to it at all to reap some of the benefits that our class cuties get. So definitely go over there and check out the free tier that is available to you. And until next week, as we always say, not everything is gay, but there is gay in everything, including if you know that lesbians exist, but you think you can't possibly be one of them, because if you were, you'd know already very common. (laughs) 